Hello, hello, everyone! Welcome back to Lo-Fi History. It is, it's been a minute, you know? It seems like it. It's yeah. a moment. Too, yeah. <laughs> we had our special Pride Month uh, live stream in place of Lo-Fi History last time, so it's it's been a while. So hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, if this is your first time joining us for Lo-Fi History, I am Libba, and we have uh, Marie and Glenn. And this is your opportunity to ask these fine historians your history questions, and they will be answered live. Now, I am not the historian, so I will be monitoring the chat and helping uh, make sure that all of your questions are answered. So do feel free to go ahead and throw your questions in the chat. But we always like to start with what you are wearing, and you've got some pretty, pretty dapper flashy outfits of different eras today. So, uh, Marie, why don't we start with you? What what are you wearing today? I am wearing 1840s ladies dress. This is a very much a, a day dress. It's very, uh, it's not what you would wear if you were, you know, working class necessarily, but it's also not a super fancy dress. This is what a very average person would have worn in the 1840s. I just realized I forgot my collar. <gasps> how I, dare you? I know, how dare I? You. I know. Hussy! I know! <laughs> Shame! <laughs> but I, I would have a collar on. Usually the collars are a bit bigger. Um, I, I like this one a lot. This and, is the one you just finished, isn't it? Or like recently? A year ago, actually. Oh, a year oh, okay. ago. A year yeah. ago I finished this one, but it is one of my newer Speaking outfits. of time flying. I know, yeah, right? right. <laughs> I'm going to stand up because yeah. this is my, my pride and joy of this dress. It's my fan print bodice that I handed Ooh, right here. Ooh, fan you know, print bodice. Right? So That's really pretty. Bodices, and it's also it's a very low bodice. You can see it goes like all the way down. Right. Very 1840s. Oh. So you go from like the 1820s and 1810s, and it's like way up here, and then it goes all the way down to the 1840s, where it's literally like below your hips. Oh, wow. And then it comes back up to their natural huh. waist, and it kind of hmm. stays there for a little bit. Man, Which I, is I very could, interesting. I could really enjoy a, a program on just the evolution of waistlines. Waistlines. <laughs> very that would interesting. Tell so much. I love it. So 1840s yes. day wear. Uh, so Glenn, what are you wearing today? I'm from the 1920s. The 1920s, you say? Sure, you see. Wow. <laughs> yes. So, we all talk like this? Uh, yeah. We should. We should. We'll talk like this the entire time. Yeah. Uh, no, this is, I mean, this is like super, super easy, right? Just a, a, a coat, a summer wear, of course, 1920s summer wear for, for picnics or perhaps a Chautauqua hmm. um, with the <laughs> bow ties and the pocket handkerchief that matches and of course the straw boater oh, hat yeah. which Very i love there. this thing because i searched for years trying to find one that would fit me and lo and behold in an antique store oh really nice there, there nice. it was shining like a glorious <laughs> long sought after thing yes and just said glenn glenn, I, glenn i'm here i've waited <laughs> Yeah. My, I'm here for your big fat head because <laughs> there were I found plenty of them, right? But they're for for smaller smaller people. Right, right. This is a big old seven and a half gourd nice. on top of this neck. But yes, that's <laughs> it that, found that, you. That, <laughs> you didn't find it. <laughs> well that's cool. I, I love the get up. And yes, yeah. speaking of uh nineteen twenty Chautauqua, uh, we do have our Chautauqua performance tonight, the second installment of our Chautauqua series. And I hope that our local viewers will join us tonight at seven PM. Uh, we're going to meet Dr. Mary Walker Edwards, or Mary Edwards Walker. That's it. Yes. Mary yeah, Edwards, Mary Edwards yes. Walker. Mary Edwards Walker, who is the only female recipient of the Medal of Honor, and she earned that during the American Civil War, where she was the only female assistant surgeon. And let me tell you, she's got a story. <laughs> oh, yeah. She is a fascinating figure, not only for her work during the Civil War, but she was also a clothing reform uh, advocate for women. So... Um, we, I think we probably talked about the bloomer dress, uh, mm -hmm. Marie, on here. But Marie, could you describe what is what is the bloomer dress? And maybe so, I'll find a picture real quick. Yes, the bloomer dress is very much credited to the lady Amelia Bloomer. <laughs> yes. You can't make it up. You can't make no. it up. <laughs> <laughs> so this lady has just landed her name to bloomers, which is still sometimes used for underwear today or what we think of as pantalettes. Um which is, you know, pants that you wear under things. It's your underpants. 
but for the bloomer dress, which Amelia Bloomer did not come up with, but popularized, a lot of times we give credit to people who made things popular and not mm -hmm. the people who actually created it throughout a lot of history. So every time you think like, oh yeah, this person did it, did they actually do it or did they just make it popular? Questions that you should ask yourself. Amelia Bloomer popularized it. It is a long bodice coat like top and then well bloomer pants under it literally to the so they're so synonymous with the amelia bloomer and the bloomer dress it's these big poofy pants but they go all the way to the ankle they're they're big poofy pants that go all the way from your waist to the ankle that you wear under this long tunic like coat and this was called a reform dress where pe ladies like i in the 1840s it got ridiculous how many petticoats people were using to make the dresses look so full oh yeah and it was so ridiculous that some people how ridiculous were, was it people Marie? couldn't walk <laughs> they couldn't walk some some of the most ridiculous people i mean and this is by no means all people most people have common sense and they don't put on enough skirts <laughs> to where they can't walk right but it, it the theory was that the the comic strips and you know, things were poking fun at ladies having so many petticoats to make their skirts so poofy <laughs> that they couldn't walk. Which I don't think ever actually happened, but it's funny. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dress reform started in the 1840s, 1850s. And one of those dress reforms was the bloomer pants, where basically they're, they're say, ladies are saying, I'm sick and tired of wearing so many petticoats. I want something that's going to be far more comfortable and allows me to move my body and that's how the bloomer dress comes about and i do have uh some examples of yeah. that here so we can see the uh the bloomers like you were saying the pants very fluffy but very there's also fluffy. those shorter skirts so it's it's kind of a stepping stone toward pants uh yes. but there's still i mean this still looks very ladylike to me yes. but i mean the I, silhouette is still yeah. It's so fluffy it looks like a dress, mm -hmm. but it's actual individual legs. Yes. Right. And here's a picture of Mary Walker. Um, oh, wait. Let me yeah, let me find Dr. Mary Walker in her bloomer outfit. So um, here she is. And she insisted on wearing this out of practicality, I learned, uh, being a physician. Uh, she thought this would be better for her to just move around. Well, it's hard to work with the sick and the wounded in crowded conditions with beds everywhere if you're wearing traditional female 1850s right. and 60s garb. So here she is. At that point, they had so many petticoats, then they just created the hoop skirt. Right. Uh, yeah. That solved that problem. Right. So the she, Mary Walker is uh, super cool. And she wore the bloomer dress that you saw there. Yeah. And then she took it one step forward and wore just men's clothing. Yes, yes. Like actual men's clothing. And I do have a picture of her. Of course, she her. didn't say it was men's clothing. She said, this is my clothes. And That's I am right. a woman, so these are just my clothes. <laughs> They're women's clothes because I'm wearing them. I love that. Um, let me find, there's a really good photo of her later in life because she did continue to wear, uh, well, not men's clothes, as she clothes. would argue, her clothes <laughs> that just happened to be pants. She um, wore pants. Yes, she wore exactly. pants. That is a fact. So once again, I'm going to block Glenn. And <laughs> <show you. laughs> so here she is later in life, and you notice she has that Medal of Honor mm -hmm. with her. Uh, so she was a physician for quite some time, uh, both before the war and after the war, but she also was a dress reformer. Uh, she even ran for political office, yeah. so we're going to be meeting her uh, tonight. She's super cool. Those of you yeah. close enough could meet her. Yes. And for those of our national and international audience, I believe they're about to start the Concord back up, so I suggest you hop on one of those as quick as you can. Yeah. Um, you could be supersonic to Atlanta from, say, Colorado in, what, 30 minutes? I wish. Maybe. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to know which, how, how that happened. Well, you know, it's I'll... a supersonic transport. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll get on that. Yeah. <laughs> now we have we have lots of people to say hello to. I see the chat's already got lots of questions for us. Yay. I see Olivia is hey. here. Olivia. Hello, Olivia on Twitch. And Gabby's have, there, too. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Carol on Facebook. Hey, Carol. Hey. Good to see you. We have Laura on YouTube. Hey, Laura. Hello. Susan on Facebook. Hello, Susan. We've got Alma and Gabby on Facebook. Hey. We've got Josh here. Hey, Josh. Josh. Good to hey. see you. Uh, we've got Elizabeth and Thomas. Great to see you. 
and we uh, got a fair amount of questions. So we're going right. to take take these questions in order. We've got several different streams that I'll be pulling from because we are live on Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube. <laughs> so we will start with Carol's question. Uh, Carol asks, were there German prison camps in Georgia? I know there was one near Auburn University in Alabama. Now, I wonder what era... I mean, maybe we can assume as far as like World War One or World War Two. I mean, World War Two seems right. more likely. <laughs> we I think weren't World War One as well. Oh, really? Yes, okay. there were. Yes, yes. Oh, we, okay. did, we did have uh, some German prisoner of war camps. People in, got more because we had just had a very large amount of German immigration after the wars for German unification in eighteen seventy to nineteen hundred, which means World War One starting in well. We didn't get into it till later. till later. But technically starting in 1914, you have a lot of very strong German heritage and German communities that people got very angry with during the First World War. Okay. Right. But so so we didn't we were so late we were late comers to World War One. So we didn't have a lot of time to get a lot of prisoners of war over on this side of the pond. And they had already had facilities set up for that. Uh, World War II, however, is a different critter. There are thousands of German POWs that start coming to America as early as late 1942. And they developed camps for them. And I know that, um, I don't know how many we had. I don't know how many Georgia had, but I know there was one at uh, Fort Oglethorpe uh, up in the northwestern part of the state uh, at, well, Fort Oglethorpe, right? It's, it's just outside Fort Oglethorpe. Uh, and they were... German prisoners of war. There was a significant population there of, of German POWs, and what they did was they would have these POWs agree to perform work. According to the Geneva Conventions, you can't force them into severe manual labor, but what you can say is, how would you guys like to get out of camp and actually exercise yourself and find something to do? So if it was voluntary, they would do it. So they pulled a lot of the, well, the POWs agreed to be pulled, to go work on local farms and not in businesses, but on local farms and things like that. Interesting fact, um, if this was true in Oglethorpe and in Fort Oglethorpe, and it was true around the country. The Germans who came over here and served as prisoners of war became so enamored of the United States and the prosperity that they saw that many of them applied to stay in the United States. Some of them couldn't. But as soon as they were repatriated because of the, the treaties at the end of the war, a lot of them got their family turned around and came back to the States. A, a lot of them, a lot of families. And as that went on, it became more and more difficult because of, you know, the Eastern Bloc and East Germany and the Soviets and didn't want to let Germans go back anywhere, you know, go to West Germany, much less to the United States. So it was this whole thing, but there was a lot of German immigration after World War II because of this. So yes, there, there were German POW camps in Georgia during World War II. All right, fascinating. <laughs> and thank you, Carol, appreciate that question. And I see we also have Don on Facebook. Hey, Don, <laughs> welcome. So our next question comes from Laura, and this is really interesting. Oh, Thomas! Yes, Thomas no, thank is you. here. I Hi, that's... Thomas. Thank you for your donation. <laughs> yes. Oh, Thomas. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, oh, ten dollars. Thank you so much, Thomas. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, Thomas joined us for our virtual summer camp. He was an excellent, excellent historian. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that $10 donation. And uh, before we get to the next question, thank you for that uh, donation, because I did want to mention that during the month of July, we are raffling off a Red Baron World War I model airplane. Very easy to assemble, so it's a fun time that you can spend uh, with yourself or with your family, however you like. And every $5 you donate enters you into the raffle, so of course, the more that you donate, the more that you win. So, Thomas, you just got two tickets into our raffle. So good luck. We will announce the winner on August 1st. But, of course, um, any little bit helps. So we appreciate right. whatever you can donate. And it's not a biplane. It's a triplane because it has tri three wings. Ah, take a look. Taka, taka. Oh, I see. Very taka, cool. taka, 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 taka. <laughs> what, uh, what are the uh, – is that historically accurate um, – that's pretend machine gun Pre fire. Pretend, oh, yeah. yes. 
I thought I say if your airplane sounds like that. No, no, no. I don't want to be on it. The airplane sounds like. Yeah. The machine guns go teka 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 teka. Okay. Teka, teka, teka. okay. Exactly. I'm glad we figured that out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> These are technical terms, everyone. We hope you can keep up. Right. We're historians. Um, <laughs> We're trying to do this. Yeah. So Laura <laughs> on YouTube uh, has a really great question. So why was it so important to preserve the Union? What would have been the consequences of letting the South secede? And um, I think Josh in particular were, will enjoy this because we have a new what if graphic. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so for all of our nice what if nice. questions. Nice. <laughs> I love that. So we have our first what if of the uh, day. What if? So there were... Uh, not a huge, but a, a proportion of, of northern politicians and civilians that were very much of the mindset that said, just just let them go. Why do we want to expend blood and treasure to force someone to associate with us that we don't like, that only hurt us, and that we don't really want to stay? If they don't want to stay in the Union, why should we let them go? So there was a slight northern population that said, let them go. Of course, there are other people who say, no, the union must be preserved at all costs. Uh, this was amongst the majority. And you have to remember that initially, um, slavery, of course, is central to this, to this question. That is the reason the South secedes, because it feels its power being challenged on the national level and on state levels by the federal government, which has, just because of population and demographics, greater representation from the North than from the South. So the North, so the South secedes. So the North at first is more, in, they're not interested in freeing the slaves. Not, not at first. They're interested in preserving the Union. So uh, I guess the, is the question, what if, we, if they had just let them go? Not so uh, much if the South had won. why was oh, it wow. so important to preserve the Union? So I guess really it's, it's more about those who, who thought it was important. Why did they think it was so important to preserve the Union? Hmm. That's one of those things I think you'll get different answers mm -hmm. for the, the people from the past that you ask. And, of course, we can't ask them. We have to depend upon their letters and upon newspapers and things like and that. Of course, there are some people who, in their rally cry to get people to come to fight to preserve the Union, give a very good explanation as to why R yeah. they think it should be preserved. But, of course, that's also going to be like the patriotic, go get them, fire them up speech to get people to go fight. Um which sometimes does not always reflect true, true nature of why things are going down, if that right. makes sense. Yes. I phrased that poorly, but I but, think yeah, right. yeah, I mean, it's your, an emotional point appeal. Yes. Yeah. It's an yeah. emotional, emotional appeal. appeal rather than a factual, like, this is why this is important. Right, right. What it comes down to is this. Many people felt there, there were two trains of thought, of course. There were people who thought that when you joined the Union, when you ratified the Constitution and became a part of the United States, that was it. That was a sacred Union that you had pledged yourself to and that you could not leave. It was a divorce that one person wanted to leave and the other person wanted to try and stay and make it work. Right. And yes, and there were the question of was it legal to secede that was, a big question. was always there from the beginning. And honestly, at the Constitutional Convention, they decided not to address it because that would give people an out to leave. They went into it assuming that once you were in, you were in. Mm -hmm. There were other efforts to secede, well, movements to secede from the Union. South Carolina. It's always, <laughs> no, it's not, a, it's, it's. Almost always South Carolina. <laughs> except for when it was the Northeast during the War of 1812. Uh -huh. At the Hartford Convention, the Northeastern states were against the War of 1812 because it cut into their profits. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if we don't change things, we're going to secede from the Union. Oh. Well, the war ended in American favor, and so they looked like idiots after they had <laughs> gone this far and were threatening to secede. Then there was the nullification crisis with South Carolina uh, under uh, Andrew Jackson's presidency, and that was only avoided because they reached a compromise. And so then it comes up again in 1860, and in 1860, for the first time ever, states, South Carolina, do make legally legal bodies that are representative of the voting population, white males, to leave the union. They vote to dissolve the union with the United States and the Constitution. Was this a legal or illegal act? People still argue this to this day. The South did lose the war, 
So their view was forced by defeat in combat, but is it still a thing? It's not addressed in the Constitution. Could a constitutional amendment allow secession? This is a conversation I've had with some of my buddies. Let's say I'm, oh, I don't know, South Carolina. <laughs> And we decide to secede, but instead of just declaring it over and trying to form our own army, what if we said, hello everyone, we don't like you anymore. We would like to put forward a constitutional amendment that allows us to leave. Mm. And what if all the other states said, you're South Carolina, we're fine with that. And we don't the, like you as well. Right, you know. and, and, and the, the amendment is ratified. Mm. But also then South it's Carolina con- then it's constitutional. Charleston. Oh, well, very important. Place lots of that. money. Yeah. Yes, but but that's the thing. If the states agree to it, and it's a ratified amendment in the Constitution, it is then mm-hmm. constitutional. Right. So then, could they leave? Uh, so, but these people thought the union was important because this was a sacred bond agreed to with the founding fathers, and as such, like you say, it's it's a it's. It's a marriage. It's a legally binding contract. It is a spiritual association. The amount of, of liberty. times, like Len's not using the word sacred just to use the word sacred. Right. The amount of times people said our sacred union to <laughs> basically imply that what the South was doing was just like unthinkable, awful, not just, you know. Un- legally not just unpatriotic no, but exactly like, right, but like right. it's it's something that's deeper that's this is our country and you're tearing it apart and we have to be together because that's how we were we were formed yeah, this is what's made us made us a success yes and then also you have some perhaps not as much as in the war of 1812 perhaps but could either part survive on their own they're very different but they also have things that the other needs. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's sort of like the 1860s version of the domino theory, right? Mm-hmm. Well, if if we let South Carolina go, then Georgia will want to go, and then Tennessee, and then Florida, and then Mississippi, and then Texas, and right. soon the Union is not just one state, it's the entire country yeah. begins to dissolve and fall apart. And then who, that, I mean, who's it really to say was, that, you know, you have, you know, Texas is a good example of this, who tries to declare that they're their own country. Yeah. And then you just have, you no longer have a, a union of, of states. You just have a bunch of little countries. Which is how the founding fathers at the Constitu- Constitutional Convention, when they first went there, originally saw it. Mm-hmm. There were 13 separate sovereign states joined together in a federal union, not a nation state, right? It was a, that's what federal means. It is a group of many with some with some control overall, so that's that's why they many pe- thought that the union was had to be preserved because they saw the end of the American prosperity, the end of American way of life again, for those that America worked for. Yeah. America uh, did not work for a lot of people. Remember, uh, let's say I don't know South Carolina, the majority of the population was enslaved African Americans right. who could not vote at all. Would those enslaved South uh, excuse me, enslaved African Americans vote to secede from the Union if they were allowed, not that they would were allowed to vote because they're slaves, what would they say? So a lot of people in the North also said, you're not giving voice to a significant part of your population about this Union. That, w- that was also a justification. It's like, well, if well, you can get the yeah. slaves to vote to secede, sure, First, you have to let the slaves vote. Right. Then you have to go along with what they vote. Right. They knew that wouldn't happen, but, right. but it was because then it they was could vote argument. to free themselves. Right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it seems like pretty. In a way, it's sort of like simple because, of course, you don't like you say, and you don't want it things to dissolve. Dissolve. Right. It really is so much more intricate um, when you when you dig a little deeper. So uh, excellent question, Laura. Very good. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a that's a good one. A good, good what thinking if. one. Oh, and uh, I, we just also just learned that Thomas used his allowance from doing dishes to donate wow. to us. Thomas, that is so sweet of you. That is very oh. cool. That is so neat. Oh, thank, thank you, you so Thomas. much. Thank you yeah. so much, Thomas. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Bobble DJ, hey, good to see you again <laughs> on Twitch. <laughs> Speaking of the Red Baron, brings up Snoopy defeating the Red Baron. <laughs> nice. But, Classic. <laughs> but did he? I don't know. I can't remember. In all that the one. songs, Snoopy gets shot down. Oh, really? Oh. Well, Snoopy. that's not true. In the shows, he gets shot down. In the song, um, 
Snoopy kept trying to shoot. And here's the thing. The Red Baron was shot down several times. Oh, yeah. But he yeah. didn't die. But short pause. Un until the last time. I was because there was one time. Joshua, oh, yay, thank you so thank much you, for that Joshua. twenty dollars. Oh, Josh, donation. thank you. That is so generous of you. Thank you so much. You must really want that Red Baron plane. Uh, it's a cool plane. <laughs> it is. It cool is really plane. cool. <laughs> In fact, Glenn, you actually have that. Some museum directors do have a very similar model to that in their office. Some some museum directors some. do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Josh. We really appreciate that. Thank you. But um, yeah, so so the Red Baron was shot yes. down in combat. He just he survived again until the, the last wow. one. Yeah. So there, it was very even all the aces in World War One at some point were shot down. Many of them multiple times. Many wow. of them were still flying with concussions and broken legs and broken ribs and it was a it's a very interesting thing yeah how, sounds like a how great were parachutes back then they didn't have them what they didn't have good, them yeah. in world war one they did not have it but world by world war two we had oh yeah. yes okay, okay. <laughs> oh yes yes the uh they wow. they did start to think maybe we should have them yeah but there's uh the cockpits are so small in in those early aircraft anyway right. Yeah. Trying to, and they, they thought they would be better off if they could find some way to get their plane down rather than climb out of the airplane because it's got all the wings, it's got wires everywhere. Yeah. It's hard to get out of the, and they're also at low altitude, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And with right. low altitude, you don't necessarily have time to, to get, you know, get out of the plane, get to where you can jump, jump, pull the cord and have enough time for air to fill the parachute. Right, right. It's just so, not practical. Wow. Yes. Very cool. Um, uh, Susan on Facebook would like to know more about your bodice, Marie. Is it similar oh. to smocking? So how, so technique uh, wise, how did you get that ruffled, uh, look to it? And yeah. I don't know what smocking is. Maybe you could talk about smocking. So smocking is, I think it more, oh, yay. Thank oh, you, Bobble. Bobble. Thank you so oh, thank much. You. Really love what you guys are doing with the live stream. Thank you so much, Hi. Bobble. Yeah. Great to have you, uh, have you back. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck All with right. the raffle. I'm going to stand, stand up, up so yes. that we can see <laughs> my pride and joy. Of this dress. So here we have gathers. So these are gathers. Um, kind of the same idea of smocking, if you will, but smocking usually has, well, I guess it depends on what kind of smocking you're doing. I mean, generally think of like the honeycomb smocking where you like pinch it and it's more of a, uh, a, a, a um, pattern. Like a quilting kind yes, of, yeah. more, more of a, more of a pattern. This is just gathered cool. here. So we have the, the front piece which starts here, because you can kind of see I have the gather that yeah. sort of shoulders and then comes down, and then this is a side piece, and this is a side piece, um, which is then sewn to the front bodice piece. Okay. But you can see here, I basically just gathered it, um, and then I kind of pieced it to the the bodice on the, or uh, my lining on the inside. Um, I did not, so I, this is one that I definitely wanted to do by hand because 1840s, the sewing machine is technically invented, but not everyone's using it. Three yeah. people have them. Exactly. <laughs> they are not in the hands of every people. And this is a very much an everyday kind of dress. Yeah. An everyday kind of person is not going to have the funds to buy a sewing machine. So this was very important to me to do by hand also because it, the texture would have been different. So if I had like just mowed it down with a machine, yeah. it wouldn't have the life that it has. And I think that's why cool. it kind of looks more like smocking instead of just gathers is because I did it by hand. So it's not pressed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more lively. It's um, a little more full and, and, and it's not supposed to be regular, right? It's just, mm -hmm. it's not supposed to be perfectly regular like a machine no, would do. It's no. sort of got that, right. as you say, a lot. Yes. It's, it's that texture yeah. to it. Yeah. Yes. So I just, I just gathered it really. Um, and I, this has like a nice little bit of a little bit of a stripe to it, so it's really easy to like go one stripe over, one stripe right. down, one stripe over, oh, one stripe clever. down, um, to where I could have a little bit more regularity to it. Um, but I, I did not do that necessarily. I had to do that for the cartridge pleats. I'm going to stand up again because okay. I'm also proud of this. <laughs> oh, look at this by hand. These are cartridge pleats. They oh. look like normal pleats or normal gathering, but they're not. They are They're different. really pretty. Thank you. Yeah. How long did that take? A yeah. long time. A long time. <laughs> <laughs> a very long time. I actually have a video about making this dress and this the, the bodice oh, and the skirt yeah. um, on my YouTube. If you are more interested in seeing exactly how that happened. Yeah. So what is your YouTube? It is yes. called Historical Belle, B-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, like my favorite princess, and or favorite Disney princess. 
because I have different favorite actual princesses. Well, sure, yes. Yeah, um, of historical. Don't we all. <laughs> um, but it is called Historical Belt, and that's where I talk more about historical fashion and actually show how I make a lot of my outfits that you have seen on this webcast. I'm putting, I'm just putting a reminder that it's Historical Bell, B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Yes. Oh, hey, Jim. <laughs> Good to see you as well. Saying you guys look great. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, Jim also mentioned, going back to the, the prison camp question, that there was a camp uh, between 1944 and 1945 in, at Camp Tacoa, which mm. is in Georgia. So That's, not World uh, War One, but right. like, still World, World War II. They were, so. You know, and they were scattered. They tended to put them close to an existing regular military camp because mm. you had mm -hmm. folks right. to go and watch them and things like that. But right. they were, And you didn't want a giant camp because then there were a whole lot of them. <laughs> I mean, right to control. So yeah, so yeah, so right. you had a, several multiple camps scattered about, rather than one giant camp with twenty five thousand people. Mm -hmm. Easier to control a POW pop. But again, right. the the POWs in the states were kind of like, huh, this ain't bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> I I could be in the Soviet Union and counting trees in Siberia. So. Yeah, you know. Could be worse. Yeah, plowing could corn be worse. in North Georgia ain't Find too the bad. the silver lining and everything. <laughs> you know, could be worse. Yeah. So today, uh, Alma... Oh, Alma says that Gabby is at a Girl Scout camp. That's so cool. I bet she's learning so much. That's great. Uh, but she told me I better ask a question. <laughs> all, right, all right. So Alma's question today is, what do you know about the general history of Broadway? Why is it on Broadway? When did musicals, as we think of, become popular? Um, this is actually something that's a little bit in my wheelhouse. And yeah. you too, Marie, and maybe, maybe Glenn as well. Theater history classes. That's yeah, right. exactly. I had one. <laughs> you had one. I had one theater history class. But the you know the 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 short story of how did Broadway happen? I mean, we have operas, of course, in mm -hmm. Europe, and operas are very popular for the elite class mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. I don't know when opera began, Marie. I'm not sure if you're you have a guess. I would imagine mm -hmm. around the like definitely by the 1600s. I was say Renaissance feels yeah. like the birth of it. Right, right. So I maybe a little it's bit hard earlier. to pinpoint exactly, and then like its exact modern form traceable. Right. But people have been singing songs well since forever. Ever. But yeah. I think the actual <laughs> form of opera that we kind of associate opera with today started more renaissance -y. Yeah. Italian yeah. renaissance -y. Yes, Italian, Italian renaissance, renaissance And then you do see operettas uh, mm -hmm. come about a little bit later. So if you've ever heard of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, you, you may have heard of like the Mikado or the Pirates of Penzance. Those are... Uh, comedies. So once you see operettas come about and more comedic stories that are a bit more uh, approachable to the lower classes of society, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, that's when it, it becomes a bit more popular to have something that's closer to what we see in uh, Broadway. But it's not really until um, Gershwin, really, that we have in America our first it's, it's called an opera, but we have Porgy and Bess, which, which is an opera, but it was an opera that, one, featured a lot of jazz influence, which, of course, Gershwin um, was really heavily influenced by. And uh, it also centered around African-American characters, which was also kind of, uh, I mean, you had minstrel shows, but that's not the same. Those weren't usually African-Americans. they weren't usually right? African-Americans, yeah. you know. Uh, so it's, it's different that our first musical theater piece in America, like America's first opera, America's first debut of uh, musical uh, theater on stage was Porgy and Bess, and a really fantastic music, but from there, um, you, you have more comedic plays, and comedy is really what puts Broadway on the map uh, in in America. Now, Marie, I don't know if you have anything to add to this, because I can... I know there are early Broadway shows but when we have the golden age of you know in the 40s and 50s with mm -hmm. uh rogers and hammerstein oh, yeah. and all that and then sort of a resurgence with les mis and, and Phantom. Phantom of the yeah. opera yeah that's some good stuff but I don't, is there stuff. am i missing any um, key pieces to the to the story do you think uh well broadway itself was not necessarily like a show district at first right. i think it was kind of more of a not great section of town yeah uh for a lot of it and then well as in most not great sections of town uh, it's cheap <laughs> and uh you can you can you know build a theater there and it's not going to cost that much money for the land uh and then it kind of 
spiraled into being an entertainment district. Uh, also in the 20s and 30s, you have, you know, uh, variety shows and, and vaudeville, vaudeville yes. uh, which yeah. kind of also are, are not necessarily directly linked to the American musical, but do have a lot of influence into oh, yeah. the American Absolutely. musical for Absolutely. sure. See, yeah. I was going to and y'all, y'all can correct me on this. I was going to say going back to Beggar's Opera. And oh, yes. Lane, oh, that's a good point. That's like that's the first. Point. When was that? That was Beggar's 17, Opera, 1750, 1750s, 60s, yes. mm-hmm. which was kind of a proto musical. Right, right. And it, you know, yeah. as it, 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 it made gay rich and rich gay, as they said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that, that was what, that's where I was going to say it started. But that's yeah. not American. That started in London. That's true. But they did very quickly start trying to do adaptations of it over here. Right. right. Because it was mind-blowingly popular. Yeah. And and I'm not. I have never seen the Beggar's Opera, and I honestly don't know much about the plot. Do you? I've, know I've what read. It's about, I've read or? parts of it. Yeah. I've never come close to seeing it performed. I would love to. Yeah. I would absolutely love to. David, thank you so much for the twenty dollar <laughs> donation. Thank you. Hello, our friend from Wales. <laughs> David, thank you so much. That 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 really helps. We're almost uh, almost halfway. Uh, that's awesome. So um, Alma, uh, there there are excellent resources on the history of Broadway. Um, I, there's one that I wish I, I knew the exact title to. Um, I'll, I'll try to look it up. But I, that I read that I really enjoyed was years ago. So it's, a lot of it's gone from my head. But <laughs> <laughs> I got the. You don't remember art. every textbook from I, college? I don't. Live up. <laughs> I know. But, Ask me uh, about macroeconomics, folks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, I, I would love to do a live stream. I think we're all well equipped to do a live stream on the history of Broadway. So, yeah, that'd um, be really cool. I'm going to add that to our program uh, ideas. That would be really fun. So thank you so much, Alma, yeah. and and please say hi to Gabby, uh, Gabby the Girl Scout when <laughs> when she gets back. <laughs> so let's see. Um, oh, excellent. Okay, so we have uh, Elizabeth. Uh, okay, here, Thomas, we finally get to your question. <coughs> so, Thomas would love to hear about cavalry units. Is there a U.S. military campaign that they were most important in? Are they still active? So, uh, just in case someone's not familiar, Glenn, start us off with what is a cavalry unit? The cavalry fights on horseback. It is mounted soldiers, usually that fight on horseback. There are some cavalry units that are designed to simply move by horseback so they can move quicker, get off the horse, and then fight on foot. Yes, the Americans um, had a lot of mounted units. Even in the colonial era, the different colonies, especially the further you get south, especially in Georgia, they need to sort of patrol the frontier, right? And so the best way to do that is mounted units. And so they would have mounted ranger units. Today, we think of the rangers as the elite forces, but really what it means is to range, right? To to go fur for fur, to go fur a fur piece out, and then come back around and report what you've seen, if nothing or anything like that. So cal- cavalry becomes very important. You get to uh, in the North in the French and Indian War and in the American Revolution, it's not that important. The the topography doesn't really lend itself, and so people thought we don't need cavalry in the American Revolution until the war moves south. Once the war moves south. The, both the British and the American forces realize, wow, cavalry is very handy down here because there aren't a lot of open fields, but there are a, not also not very many roads. And if you have a good cavalry force that can move fast, you can control a lot of the roadways and the road junctions. So cavalry plays a huge role in the American South during the American Revolution. As a result, once we gain independence, the United States does maintain cavalry forces. The problem with cavalry forces is they're much more expensive than infantry because you're having to pay for the horses, you're having to pay for the horses feed, you're having to pay for blacksmiths to do the shoes and all the things. So as the United States grows, it does have cavalry units, but they tend to be smaller and smaller until you get to the American Civil War. And both sides employ a huge amount of cavalry during the Civil War, most of it not in actual charges like you think of, but to protect the flanks of the army and do a lot of scouting. There are tens of thousands of cavalry forces, both north and south. That's a, that's, it's, a it's own fascinating thing. After the American Civil War, as always, the American military shrinks, and they develop cavalry on a very limited basis. Uh, 
The cavalry is generally where the least promising and lowest grade graduates from the military academies go. George Armstrong Custer, for example. The, the cavalry is where they stick them. Now, lots of people like horses, so they want to go to the cavalry. Dwight Eisenhower, uh, George S. Patton, uh, Douglas MacArthur, all these guys come up in the cavalry. But by the time, of course, you get to World War I, that's just the era where mechanization is starting. Trench warfare does not uh, loan itself to cavalry maneuvers. In other theaters, like in the Eastern Theater between Germany and Russia, and the Mesopotamian Theater with the Turks and the British and folks like that in the, in the, uh, the Arab Revolt, there is a ton of mounted forces that have to move around quickly. So World War I cavalry is interesting. But by the time you get to World War II, most forces have shifted from mounted on horses soldiers to mounted on vehicle shield, uh, soldiers. And so from that point on, everything really becomes mechanized. There are still technically, there's the first cavalry division in the United States, but they use light vehicles and helicopters. So we don't really have cavalry forces anymore. The tactics do sort of transfer, right? They're flanking maneuvers, wide sweeping, fast moving, but but that's a, the very brief history of cavalry in the United States military. And then yeah. some people would say that airplanes became the cavalry of the sky. Ah, yes. that makes so sense, yeah. If you want to, because right in World War One, you have the dawn of the airplane, the end of the, the horse right. in battle. Uh, and some people kind of equate that together being the, well, that the... The Air Force is now like the modern day cavalry. Right. Or the, or the, and, and, and or the tanks. Mm -hmm. Right. Fast moving stuff. But yeah, it's, it's too bad because cavalry is really it's cool. It is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think Civil War is probably one of the most well known cavalry units for me. And I think probably one of the best uses of that in America. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, yes. And they would go, you know, especially the Union forces, once they figure their cavalry out. Uh, could go on very deep raids in the mm -hmm. Confederate territory, tear up what little railroads there were, disrupt supplies, and things like that. So, David says, uh, I joined the Household Cavalry Lifeguards in UK. Oh, yeah. It was a posh regiment that you could become an officer. When I was cool. when I was in, it was tanks and APCs. Yeah. Oh, nice. you were in the guards? Wow. Uh, wow. I don't know, David, let us know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's very cool. <laughs> that is very cool. I also wanted to mention that uh, Alma says, I love when you talk about your costumes. I often go to the History Center YouTube channel and select a random show I haven't seen to uh, <laughs> listen to while I sew. That's awesome. <laughs> and you definitely, if you haven't already, I bet you have, but definitely check out Marie's uh, channel oh, yeah. because that's just chock full of awesome content, especially for, uh, for seamstresses. All right. So, oh, Thomas says, thank you. Yay. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> So our next question, uh, let's see, comes from Susan. So Susan on Facebook asks, what was Maryland's plan if the South had won the Civil War? Uh, since they were a slave state, but didn't succeed, uh, secede, what would they have done? So I need a little bit more context, I think. So what was going Border on with states. Maryland? Yeah. Yes. Borders like Maryland, right. sort oh, of okay. Tennessee, Kentucky. No, right. I mean, Tennessee was part of the Confederacy, though. Well, it was still a border state because mm. the eastern third of the state was very mountainous and was not very friendly to secession. Oh, no. It was a okay. hotbed of unionism. Uh, yeah. Maybe not yeah. anti-slavery, but it was certainly pro-union. Gotcha. And that's one thing that you, sh I think people kind of gloss over is that there were a lot of people who were not, some of them not even slave owners, uh, and, and then some people who probably were indeed slave owners and or are enslavers and also still did not want to leave the union right and uh, in, in the south mm -hmm. in all states right but so okay so so Mar so maryland Mar yeah. so maryland um kentucky also kentucky. yeah kansas almost went that way if yeah it hadn't killed everybody in there before the war that was a whole thanks john brown <laughs> bloody um, kansas <laughs> yeah whole miniature civil war before the actual center war so wow. maryland was indeed a very strong slave state uh of course you know washington dc the u.s capital is there between virginia and maryland it's just in a little part there 
Virginia did secede, so that made things complicated for the U.S. Capitol. What if Maryland had also seceded, right? Then the entire United States Capitol, talk about arguments over federal territory in recently seceded states, would make Fort Sumter look like a nothing. What if the U.S. Capitol was in two southern seceded states? To that end, there was a large secessionist movement in Maryland. It almost happened. It was really, really, really close to happening. Yeah. What happened? The totalitarian dictator, Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> decided to send troops in, suspend uh, habeas corpus, uh, and just arrest people that were threatening secession and the ringleaders, put them in jail without charge, and he kept them there, there for about a year. Wow, I had right? no idea. He sent troops in to Baltimore to put down riots. Mm. Um, and I say, you know, I say totalitarian, di- dictatorial, mostly jokingly, but but that's yeah. what it, I mean, that <laughs> of all the things that Lincoln was having to deal with when he first came to office, proximity itself said that you have to deal with Maryland first. Right. Because you cannot lose the capital. Right. So, so yes, he did. He sent federal troops to put down, uh, to squash free speech, to put down riots, to arrest protesters and political ringleaders who had technically broken no laws whatsoever. Wow. But they were extreme steps, but those steps, depending upon your point of view, uh, were necessary to preserve the Union because you had to preserve the capital. Mm-hmm. So that is why Maryland became so important. Um, if Maryland had gone, I'm not saying that the United States would have lost the Civil War, but it would have lost so much momentum and so much um, energy, probably, from having its capital taken over by the South. Think of it. The South may have put their capital in Washington, D.C., right, if, if that had happened. Yeah. So it's... So it may not have changed the ultimate outcome of the war, but it certainly would have sent it down a different path, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the South had a lot of momentum at the beginning to begin with as well. Right. So. Ideological. From a political standpoint, a lot of momentum. Mm-hmm. Well, and then also they won a lot because the Union win- had not great generals for the well, first part of the war. They had some McClellan just They had some there. problems. Yeah. They did. <laughs> Had some problems. So it, it would have given the South even more momentum, which is a whoo. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like a oh, what, so, yeah, what so, would have happened? Yeah, that's a big what if. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, um, but then it comes becomes the philosophical question. Lincoln had to do it, but was he legally authorized to do so? Was he right. morally authorized to do so? Hmm. That's an open question that we can't answer. That you're just going to have to ponder on. Yeah. Right. History also, offers us a lot of this. It, yes. it, doesn't it, though? Yes. It does. Doesn't it? What were you going to add? Uh, West Virginia was created because Virginia wanted to secede, and West Virginia did not. I didn't know that. And I that is no how idea. we got West Virginia. Virginia wow. says, we secede. And the western oh. part said no. No, they, no, they said, fine, we secede, too. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. And From you. Vir- Virginia <laughs> says, wait, you can't. Oh. Wait a second. <laughs> we can't say you can't <laughs> secede. Hmm. Because we did that. Because we yeah. did. <laughs> oh, it's too late. They seceded and joined the Union as West, the state of West Virginia. Nice. Like that. Wow. I had no idea. Which, yeah. um, also, we had a county. Uh, I, I find this so fun. Such a fun Georgia story. Dade County seceded from, when Georgia seceded from the Union. Well, actually, they did it before Georgia seceded from the Union because this Georgia was not seceding fast enough for them. <laughs> and they also just weren't you know entirely happy with the way anything was going so they seceded from the confederacy and from the union and decided that they were the independent country of dade county <laughs> wow and, for them. and decided that they were going to be an independent county wow i'm sure that was until allowed. the 1940s yeah. what when the whole, president fdr sent them a telegram welcoming them back to the union and they wow. had like this big to do <laughs> legally nothing yeah, right, changed right, right. ever yeah yeah but ideologically, Sometimes, they were their own country for like a hundred years. Wow. Sometimes meaningless victories are the best. <laughs> I just, I think it's just one of the most interesting pieces of North Georgia history. That is fascinating. The independent country of Dade County. Wow. <laughs> so Olivia, we are finally getting to your question on Twitch, uh, which I love this one. So if you recall the uh, the nation states that you both created a few uh, lo-fi histories ago. Uh, I soup. 
Yes, yes. I can't remember what that stood for. I don't either, but I remember it's <laughs> eye soup. So Olivia says, all right, so Glendonia and eye soup are allied in a war, oh, okay. and you both must agree on one historic battle to borrow the tactic in this Ooh. upcoming battle. Would you choose the American and French forces at Yorktown? Note, the battle will have the same results as the historic one. Ooh, a lot of contingencies here, but I love it. I okay, love so it. if I pick the winning one, I'm going to win. Yes. yes. That's good. But which, which tactic, uh, which battle would you choose to uh, kind of copy the tactics from? Can I? Can I? Yes. Oh, uh, is that a question? That, no, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> the battle. C-A-N-N-A-E. All right, what is can I? 216 B.C. Wow, that's that's when that's Hannibal a crushed both consular armies of Rome in one day. In one day. Wow. I'll go with that. It's the one that it's the one that all generals ever since then have tried to replicate in some way, form, or fashion. What made a it double and it's a double envelopment. Oh. Right? He started his forces out instead of a straight line against a straight line, he put his forces in a circle like this, or a half circle butting out in the front. So the Romans came in and they began to push that front and the front began to fall f began to fall, fall back, right? He knew this was going to happen. And so it turned from a this way into a this way. Uh -huh. So as the Romans pushed further and further, they pushed that center back, then the ends of Hannibal's forces came up this way and double enveloped and countered them on the flanks and Ooh. surrounded them. Ooh. And that took place Scary. in about an hour, and he spent the wow. next wow. six hours simply killing everyone, going in further and further inside. Yikes. And people have been trying to replicate that ever since. It's pretty vicious of yeah. you, Glendonia. It's a, uh, <laughs> we need, we're going to win, right? You know, we, I we like to, to win. Yes, Winning the other important. side is just the most evil, purely evil force you could think of. So you will just, you know, we got to think of something yeah. that's going to defeat them. Glenn's rule, Glenn's rule of history number three. <laughs> Never lose a war. Never lose a war. <laughs> Otherwise, then you're the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I suppose so. How was that, Olivia? <laughs> you weren't expecting that one, were you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Olivia. That was really fun. So our next question is from Josh on YouTube. Why were Sumer's inventions, besides writing, uh, so prevalent to this day? Now, Sumer, is that, am I thinking Sumeria? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Why do you take writing out of the equation? <laughs> besides writing. I mean, that's not fair, <laughs> Josh. Maybe, but maybe because that's what most people, I mean, that's the first thing uh, I was like, I know, Sumeria equals so, early writing. So here's... <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember if this is if this was Sumer or if it was Ur. Um, you've kind of you've kind of got me in a blank here. But one of those very early cities, the writing wasn't writing, right? The earliest examples of writing we have are tallies, are lists of kings and of grain supplies. But what that means is you have the civilization to go along with it. If you have a list of kings, that means you have multiple kings, which means you have a stable form of government to record, number one. Number two, if your writing consists of keeping kings that records the government, it is also tallies of your food supply and your grain and things like that, which means you have a surplus. You have a surplus product from your agriculture, which means you have to have a complex society. With a surplus of food, you begin to have specialized labor, you begin to have an expansion of population, you begin to have things that make, um, that, that takes you from wandering, you know, hunter-gatherers and tribal organizations into something that is closer to what we call civilization. So, you know, uh, around the Tigris and Euphrates with Sumer and with Ur and some of those very, very early cities, that's what you have. That's what makes civilization is a surplus of food production that leads to specialized labor, which leads to a need to organize all of this into a set pattern to benefit the most lives. That is where you get your organized government. <laughs> so basically, aside from writing, you're saying that they offer 
offered that organized society. I th- the, I th- yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think, I, so. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I've, I've got an example of early Sumerian writing, just in case you've never oh, seen yes. it. So I can't tell you anything about it, but this is what it looks like. That's. I think some of them look like fish. Hmm. That I never funny. considered that point that it's trying to express. Interesting. <laughs> You're fluent, right? <laughs> I'm fluid. Flu- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but very cool. Thank you, Josh. Uh, let's see. Um, we did that one. Do-do-do-do-do. Making sure we got all of our questions. Do-do-do-do-do. Oh, and David said uh, he was never an officer, but he was uh, just an NCO. That's okay. Right. That's awesome. Not Officers. just an NCO. Yeah, you're not you just an NCO. NCO. I will let me let me tell you this. I will confess that in all the military things that I've collected, I don't think I have a single officer thing. They're all enlisted men stuff from you know the from the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, the Desert Storm stuff. I don't have any officer things. And I didn't realize this until about a year and a half ago, and I'm not sure how it happened. And I began to think, hmm, I wonder if that's a hole I need to fill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, um, we we only have a few a few minutes, and we do have to end right at five today, uh, so we can prepare for our Chautauqua. Yay! Yay. But uh, so, Thomas, we are going to answer your awesome question about uh, how some cuisines became popular after troops have been stationed in a new country. That's an excellent topic. I'm going to save that one. Yes. So, Thomas, uh, next time we have Lo-Fi History, which is not this coming Tuesday, but the next, uh, you'll catch us. <laughs> um, <laughs> we will we will have that question. and we I'm also... a little shocked at what our donation thing yeah. went up to, right? Thank you Look so at that. much, it's... y'all. We got over halfway. Uh, thanks to y'all. Thank you so much to... Um, Oh, Jim, Jim, thank you so much. I feel like I, I must have missed that somehow. Uh, I hope I didn't. The $10 uh, and says, thanks for keeping history alive. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, David, Bobble, Joshua, and Thomas for all of those awesome do- donations that got us uh, over our um, halfway point. Mm-hmm. Now, to end, I am gonna. I will take uh, David's question uh uh, how quick question how did the history center start so Glenn, do you want to give a brief history of, of the history <laughs> how long center? do i have <laughs> you got one minute <laughs> one minute okay so there was once a fellow named james mathis senior who was very interested in the history of this region he owned a bank he was you know he had some money he had some means he started going to antique stores and things and collecting things out of old barns, and he would put them in the lobby of his bank. He also decided, because it was cool, to keep chickens in a coop outside of his bank. His wife started getting tired of all the bank being cluttered up with things and the chickens walking around outside of the parking lot. So he worked with the city of Gainesville. They had an empty firehouse that they agreed that the History Center, excuse me, the Georgia Mountains Museum at that point, could move into and take a couple of rooms. A lot of other organizations in town had several rooms, uh, the Community Foundation, the Nature Center, uh, a couple, several other nonprofits were in this, and the Georgia Mountains Museum got a couple of rooms. As these other organizations grew and moved out to their own buildings, the Georgia Mountains Museum spread into all these other rooms. And so eventually, that whole building was the Mountains Museum. And then another fellow named John Jacobs and the president of Bernal, John Bird decided that it would be really nice to have a dedicated museum building on Bernal's campus that could do that. And so they worked together. They raised the money to build the building. The cabin and the blacksmith shop had already moved here. And so the Northeast Georgia History Center proper opened in 2004. And from 2004 until today, we have expanded. We've, we've made better exhibits. Uh, we've made the American Freedom Garden. We have gotten the Digital Studio. We've gotten the Adam A. Avister Education Center. And so that, that, in a nutshell, is how the History Center came to be. Yay! Yay! That was stuff I didn't even realize. <laughs> Very early stuff. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, Karen, uh, good to see you. I know that you've been watching. Uh, Karen says thank you for what you do and that we are, we are historical rock stars. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Robert, we will get to your question as well about who is the best unknown Civil War general on both sides. That'll be an interesting topic for next time. And Thomas, we will get to your question as well. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to uh, end with our screen about our July raffle, just in case you've been inspired to donate. (laughs) Uh, Thank you all so much. We will see you not next Tuesday, but the next. But the next. (laughs) All right, everybody, take care. Goodbye, everyone.